everyone and welcome to my talk about how to cope when your Kubernetes misbehave. My name is Etiel Schwartz and I'm the co-founder and CTO of Commodore, a startup designed to help developers and DevOps to troubleshoot their Kubernetes much faster. Today we are going to talk and go over applications that are failing in Kubernetes. For those of you who aren't running on Kubernetes, I will say this is very common. For those of you who are running Kubernetes, I really hope that this talk will help you to gain uh, actionable tools that you will allow you to solve issues much faster when coping with Kubernetes. So I think it's quite obvious that Kubernetes is eating the world. It, it is eating our industry. Basically, every company is now a Kubernetes company. And there is a really good reason for that. And that is Kubernetes is a great and very cool technology. But on the other hand, Kubernetes does have a downside. Even it looks super easy and super fun, it has really rough edges. And when you encounter one of those rough edges, you sometimes get really, uh, really hurt. So I think that the reason why Kubernetes is so complex is because people are not that sure how they should handle it. It looks very easy to get started. Basically, at the first second, what happens is you do kubectl apply. You get your application up and running across the cluster, which is amazing, great satisfaction. But then you move your application to production and you start to realize that not everything is as amazing as that kubectl apply. You see failures that you don't really understand. You don't know if the problem is in the application layer or in the infrastructure layer. Basically, Kubernetes does a lot of great work in abstracting the issues and problems from you, which is great for the day-to-day. -day, but once you have a problem, you find yourself unaware how did everything just work until now and how I'm going to solve it and solve the issues. So what makes Kubernetes troubleshooting so complex? I think that the first thing is that Kubernetes is uh, uh, like a breeding organism. It keeps on changing, version change, nodes change, pods change. Everything keeps on changing. But for most people, they are running blind, meaning they don't really know what happened inside their cluster, what version change, what kubectl version change, or who pushed what, when, and why. The other problem is Kubernetes is actually an ecosystem of a lot of different tools that affect it. It might be things inside the Kubernetes cluster itself, things like PVC, load balancer, and nodes issue can affect the system of Kubernetes, but also things like AWS, uh, LaunchDarkly, Argo CD, a lot of different things might affect the overall system health. And once you have a problem in Kubernetes, it is not that clear where should I go now. Should they go directly to kubectl, maybe to Datadog, maybe to AWS, and you find more yourself like basil with all of those different options to investigate. And basically, you need a lot of experience and a lot of time to solve issues in Kubernetes. The last thing that is not really unique to Kubernetes, but it's true for any distributed system, is the butterfly effect. Meaning a change, uh, like an innocent change that shouldn't have affected anything, makes your production go burst into flames. And I will say Kubernetes, again, makes it look very easy or make it do changes very easily, but the root cause, the root, uh, the, the effect it might have on your production cluster is catastrophic. And I think that without understanding all of those different dependencies, you are going to find yourself trying to troubleshoot issues that you are not really sure how to solve. But luckily for everyone here, you are now in the talk about four things you can do when your Kubernetes is misbehaving. Basically, I'm going to take an application already running inside my cluster. We're going to troubleshoot it together. We're going to add more and more tools in order to solve issues in this application, basically to find the root cause of the problem in the application. The uh, the, the game here is to get as much information as we can without changing the application at all. That means what we're going to do is we're going to add more and more tools for our, inside our cluster. So we'll gain better visibility, better observability on what is happening inside the system. And in this way, we're going to solve the issue or at least try to go to the bottom of exactly what is the problem. 
So I think there is no better time than start than now. And uh, I'm going to go into my terminal. I hope it will work. And I'm going to do port porting because the application is not like, uh, doesn't have any uh, connection to the internet. And we're going to start with like doing the port forwarding. And now I'll go and open the website and I'm going, it's like uh, 8080 localhost. And everything looks like it is working. We got the low world, everyone is happy. The application is up and running and good for us. Now I'm going to go to one of the endpoints, the demo endpoint, so we can really try and make some fun. Okay, this is not good. This means my application is not working as expected, but something is blocking it. Something is moving extremely slow. So now in order to find out what is happening, I'm going to introduce you for the first concept, which is distributed tracing. So one second. Distribu distributed tracing is basically tracking our request across different services. So at the moment, all we know is we have one service called the website, and this service is not working correctly. In order to find out what really happens inside the cluster, we're going to install an open source tool named Miso. So I already download like Miso uh, CLI, so I have it installed. So all I need to do is to install it in my cluster. So I have my application up and running, and now I'm trying to use Miso in order to find out what is really happening inside the cluster and given a single request, what flow is my system uh, experiencing and where exactly is the relevant bottleneck, if any, across the across the topology and uh, the installation is all up and running and now let's do the view and it is opening the url itself i'm going to use password one and password one as a great password and i only care at the moment about the default namespace. So Mizu is a tool that allows us to record traffic, meaning it captures everything that is happening inside the cluster and it can show us different things. So I'm going to hit request again and again. And hopefully I will see some sort of data here. Ah, and I can see that I got 500. But the interesting thing here to see is that I have the web service default, and this is actually talking with a different service. This is talking with the backend service. So basically now I know that I don't have only like a one single service, but two different services, the backend and the, uh, and the website, and the backend is returning 500 for us. So using distributed tracing, I was able to find out that I had, that my application was actually being transferred into a different microservice. And more than that, that microservice is now returning 500 for us. Basically, we're now able to find who, who should I blame, e, what microservice is responsible for the problem that I'm experiencing. Without this, without having distributed tracing, I should have go to the website the code and system and to try to figure out what went wrong here. But now I know that my problem probably lies elsewhere. It lies in the backend service. So it gives it gave me the relevant information, but more than that, it allowed me to know that it got 500. So something uh, is uh, like working unexpectedly over the backend. So uh, I will say that if you are running in micro monolith uh, in a microservice architecture, distributed tracing is a must. It allows you to track your requests across different services. And without it, you are going to be lost and like bazzled when you will have encounter an issue because you won't know exactly what journey did the HTTP or did a specific request had. And this will in turn uh, make troubleshooting much, much harder and much more complex. I think that the hard thing about distributed tracing is that you usually need to invest time before playing with it. And you should add as much relevant metadata and context. and it is not a simple tool. Like a lot of the developers I know are afraid of using like distributed tracing, even if it is very easy. And like 
quite simple, mainly because it is not the standard. It is not like the other things that I'm going to talk about like in a minute. It is still relatively new and you need to educate your team about how do I use it and what's the proper way of doing so. So I think that we are all set up for that. Okay, so we installed Miso. Now we know our application hey, is getting like 500 for the backend, but what else can we get? So now I'm going to talk a bit about metrics. Metrics is the ability to understand not only like if my application is healthy or not, but what, uh, what sort of like external data it exposed that will allow us to understand and to publish with the issue. External data or external metrics might be things like the CPU, the memory, the number of 500, a lot of different uh, numbers that will allow us to know if the system health is overall good or not. In order to use uh, or to get those metrics, we're going to install Prometheus on top of our cluster. So I'm going to stop Miso, if you don't mind, and I'm going to install Prometheus. Uh, luckily, uh, everything we're going to do is super easy to use because there are really like great community around all of those different tools. So installing Prometheus is as simple as doing an Helm install command. And when we talk about metrics, the important thing to remember is that you should have those metrics already up and running even before an issue occur. You should be able to monitor your system to make sure that you have the right CPU, memory, latency, error rate before going into production. If not, the first time that your production is going to be down, you'll be like cursing the one starting and going live to production without making sure all of the relevant metrics are already installed and in place. So we're doing it like after the fact, but it's not best practices. You should do it before starting. Now let's see if it installed, not yet. And sometimes it does take a bit of time. So in the meantime, I will say that Prometheus is like the most open, popular uh, open source project for metrics tracking, but there are also tools such as Datadog and New Relic uh, or like AppDynamic that will allow you to get all of the relevant data even without like uh, managing the uh, cluster and infra of running Prometheus on yourself. So it can be like a very good SaaS alternative. And if you are running Kubernetes and you have nothing to visualize your metrics and CPU, like your metrics, CPU memory, and so on, you are doing something wrong. Like those are the key things to start when installing a new system on top of your production cluster or migrating into like a new microservice architecture. So the installation is still in progress. Let's check like what is happening here. So I can do like pods and this will allow me to see the status of my installation. One second in the monitor. So I see Prometheus is now starting all of the different pods. So it will be able to create and to make sure like everything is working as expected. So one second, ah, there is a job running before Prometheus is installing. And this is basically Prometheus setting up all of the relevant uh, data points for, for itself to run properly. So we are going to wait for the installation to finish. And maybe I will jump already, as you know, and I didn't say it on the beginning, this is a live demo, meaning things might get wrong, Prometheus might take a bit longer in order to install. So we're going to jump in into the presentation and I want to talk about what kind of metrics you should usually keep track on. The first metric that is super important is CPU. And when I talk about the CPU or when I talk about any metric in Kubernetes, there are two or three key factor to remind, to remind yourself. The first one is the actual usage. How many cores is my application currently utilizing? The second number is the request. How many CPU were like granted for me a priori to that uh, as the request of my application? Did the application said it need like one CPU, two CPU, three CPU, and so on. The third metric that is, or like the third, uh, the third thing that you should remember around the metric is the limit. What is the max CPU my system can use? So there's like a circle between the actual usage, the limit and the uh, request. And this in turn allows us to monitor if your application is running in a, in a, like a decent manner. If it uses much less 
than the request. It means that like we're overutilizing, which is not bad because we are wasting resources. If it is above what it was requested, it means that the application doesn't have enough resources to function properly. And this is as well a problem. So now let's try and see if the installation was completed. Yeah, I'm happy to say it was. So I'm going to do a port for, for Prometheus, a port 3000. So let's see if it works as expected. Yeah, it looks like it is working. Now I need to get the secret or the password that is inside one of the secrets. So I'm going to hit this one and I see the password is from, let's see if it will work in value because I copied this by mistake, sorry. Okay, so we have Prometheus up and running and this Prometheus is now um, monitoring all of the metrics for the, this cluster. I will say that Prometheus and Grafana work perfectly together and they have a lot of dashboards right off the box to track your Kubernetes cluster. I'm going to do a, a few requests. So I will make sure like the application is up, running, feeling the stress so we can monitor it in a second in the relevant Kubernetes dashboard or the relevant Prometheus dashboard. So it will take us a second. Okay, I did three different requests. I think this is enough. Now I'm going to the explore, oops, sorry, to the dashboards, and I'm going to check the pods of all of my services. So I have like two pods here. I have the backend deployment and like the web deployment. And I can see that the CPU utilization of the web is close to zero. But on the other hand, I can see that the backend deployment is 200% out of the CPU request and 200% out of the CPU limit. That means that I shouldn't be that alarmed that things are not working as expected because in the end of the day, what happens here is that my system is really overutilized and my service just can't handle all of this like great load that he's experiencing. And that's the reason things are not working uh, in my system. So again, without changing the application, without doing anything, we are a bit closer to find the root cause of the issue that you are currently experiencing. We now know that there are two different services. We know that the backend is returning 500. And now we can say that we're not that surprised because the reason we're getting those 500 is probably related to the fact that the system is really overutilized. So now let's go back. We talked a bit about the limit and the actual usage. Another really key metric to keep track is the node failing status. If you're running Kubernetes, sometimes the node themselves, the infrastructure running Kubernetes is not working as expected. Those areas are super hard to troubleshoot. You should really invest the time in monitoring them beforehand. And I can't stress it enough. You never suspect the nodes until it is the nodes. So our application is still not up and running and we're not happy. Now let's try to get even deeper into what is happening. And in order to do so, I'm going to add a bit of log tracking for my application. I'm going to use Loki, which is a free open source log aggregator, and I'm going to install it as well. So now I'm going to install Loki. Oh, sorry. I'm going to, to install Loki. So again, I'm using the community version. So everything should be up and running in a couple of minutes. Usually things do work quite fast in uh, when installing Loki. It basically uses Grafana UI in order to visualize us the logs of the system. So again, we need to wait a few, a few seconds for Lock it to finish the installation. And once it will finish the installation, what we're going to do is we are going to again, like do a bit of request for the back end and the front end. Uh, everything is working as expected. Again, I'm going to do port forwarding. And before going into the port forwarding, I'm going to do again a couple of mock requests just to make sure the system is working as expected. So I did those requests. I need to get again the secret. So I'm going to do it. And we have here the secret for Loki. Please don't copy it. 
and it's on port 301. Everything is amazing. I'm going to explore and I'm going to start with like finding everything inside the default namespace. So I'm going to get namespace default. And I think that that's the right syntax. Bad gateway, so maybe it is still up and running. Let's view what is happening here. Yeah, so Loki is now should be working up and running. And yeah, now the request is good. Let's do again a couple of requests just so we'll get the data up and running. And then three different requests. Okay, so we got all of the relevant requests uh, or all of the relevant logs. I can now go and see that for a specific thing you know, as part of the backend job, I got the following like relevant uh, line. Service process time was too long. And I can see not only that it returns like 500, but we now know that the problem that why we return 500 is that the process time was too long. Logs allow us not only to understand like the high level overview, but really to deep dive into the application and to find out what's the issue and what is the problem. So again, I'm going to go back to the lecture now. And I think as logs usually add as something that the past ETL is writing for like the future ETL. I'm adding those lines for the minute my house is going to be on fire. The minute I will need some clues on why my application is crashing, I can go back to, back to the logs and to find out what's the problem, what's the issue, and how can I fix it. I think without writing logs, it is super hard to find issues or to find problems, and you usually need to go over like deploy, uh, deploy over deploy, adding relevant logs and trying to find out what is happening. Also, it is okay to remove logs or to add logs after an incident, it's super common and it allows you to build a much more robust system. More than that, I think that adding relevant like metadata is super in, in, uh, impactful when trying to understand issues using logs, things like tenant, cluster, namespace, uh, business logic, everything that might help again your fellow troubleshooter to find the issue as fast as possible is super important. I'm going to stop. I have 10 more minutes, a bit less. Okay. I'm going to return. The last thing I want to talk to you about is not related to tracing or metrics or logs. It's more around your human tracking or at least finding out, given a specific issue, what went wrong. I think that even with all of the different observability or monitoring tools, you are still blind because it takes a lot of time to understand what is really like the root cause of the issues or what of the problem. Because Kubernetes is keep on changing, a lot of different teams are working on the same cluster, on the same system. It is super crucial that you'll have your own single source of truth when it comes to finding who changed what, when, and why. Without it, we are going to find the, we are going to work really hard to find the root cause. And even in the end, we won't be really sure why did it happen? Why did the system work as expected five minutes ago, but now it suddenly stopped. And I think having a single place that will allow you to find out the root cause is super valuable. Again, it is more around who should they blame? It's not a blame game in like, who should they fire? It's more around finding the root cause as fast as possible. And the root cause in like 80% of the time is someone changing something somewhere uh, along the system. To conclude, remember, failure is inevitable, but how you cope with it, how you handle it, it's totally in your hands. Make sure you have the proper tools, the proper 
culture, the proper mindset, and things will get better. Also, remember, this is like a marathon. It's not a sprint. It might take you a bit longer in order to achieve like really high resiliency, but it's a question of perseverance. It will take time, but over, over like... Over time, your system is going to get much better. Your team is going to get much better. Your tools are going to get much better. Your processes are going to be get much better. All you need is to have the mindset, work on it, and to keep on improving it. I was ETL Schwartz, and I really enjoyed uh, talking with you today. We do have a speaker gift for you. It's in the post. It's coming. Oh, oh happy to <laughs> uh, I can read the, uh, I've got the uh, questions. Um, so first one up is, is Miso tracking all requests of my cluster or can I tell it what to scan for? Yeah, uh, great question. You can configure like the relevant namespace or the relevant pods to track. So it's up for the user. I think in the demonstration, I track only the default namespace, but I could have chosen like any level of granularity. Cool. Um, I'll do another two questions. Uh, do any open source tools bring the logs, metrics, and traces together in a single pane of glass? Yeah, I think that like, you know, there is obviously like Commodore that does that. So that's like the obvious questions. But I will also say that Argo brings like almost everything other than metrics. So if you are using Argo, you can get both the changes and the logs in like a one single platform. So it's also like a very good solution. Cool. Uh, and I'll do one last question, um, but Etl, if you have time, you can answer the questions on uh, Slido. Uh, so the last one is, how can APM and synthetic monitoring be used with the Cube Prometheus stack? Yeah, um, I think that the oh. best way to do so is to basically send both the APM data and the synthetic data into Prometheus. And in that way, you can do smart aggregation and find correlation between things like synthetic tests that fail, high CPU load, for example, and the request from the APM. So by sending all of the data into Prometheus and using it as like the warehouse for all of your metrics, you'll be able to do like correlation between all of those different things. The interesting part usually is to understand the correlation and how one failure was caused due to like those issues or those problems. So I guess like it's a, it's a good way of doing so. Awesome. Um, we do have a few more questions on uh, Slido. I don't know if you guys want to continue. Yes. No. Silence means we're going to continue. Okay. Uh, let's do one. <laughs> well, let's do one last one, <laughs> and then we can go for a coffee break. Uh, I'll ask. Yeah, I'll ask the, the top one. Can you recommend open source versus, versus paid tools for change tracking? Yeah, I think that the, the best way, the best tools in terms of like open source is the Argo and basically everything that is GitOps related. Most of, if not all of those tools are open source and Terraform like as well. So there is like a very big family of tools that are open source and you can use together with Git to get like the best best of like uh, open source and, and change tracking. Uh, and again, like tools like Pomodoro uh, can provide you with like a paid version that saves you the time of basically aggregating all of those different changes into one single place. Uh, so GitHub tool, Flux, Argo are the way to go and Terraform, Pulumi in the IAC as well. Cool, awesome. Uh, you've still got questions coming into Slido, uh, but for the people who we're running out of time, or we've run out of time, I'm afraid, uh, but uh, for the people who are asking the questions and didn't get an answer, I think, Itiel, you probably could get onto Slido from the website and maybe answer them there, or else get in contact with Itiel. He's got uh, contact details on the speaker page. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks.